Welcome to our IRA seminar series. I have the great pleasure of introducing our distinguished speaker, Dr. Michael Mahoney. Michael is a researcher at the Department of Statistics and the International Computer Science Institute at UC Berkeley. He's also a faculty scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Michael received his PhD from Yale University with a dissertation in computational statistical mechanics. And after that, he worked at Yale as well as Stanford University in the mathematics department and at Yahoo Research. Michael works on algorithmic and statistical aspects of modern large-scale analysis, and much of his recent research has focused on large-scale machine learning with applications from genetics over astronomy and medical imaging to social network analysis and internet data analysis. Today, Michael will talk about practical theory for working with state-of-the-art neural network models, including questions on the role of and how theory can be formulated for models that depend so strongly on the data. So an exciting topic both on the foundational level, but also on the very concrete applications in day-to-day -day working with neural networks. So without further ado, looking forward to your talk, handing over to you, Michael. So it's great to have the chance to talk here today and thanks for the invitation. Um, it's nice to have a chance to tell you about some of the things that we've been working on recently. And as you heard in the intro, what I want to talk about is what I'm going to call practical theory for neural network models. And so this needs a bit of sort of explanation because there's a lot of people who um, work on machine learning and a lot of people who work on neural network models. There's a lot of interest in these, in this, these days, um, largely because there's been sort of clear successes in computer vision and NLP um, and sort of suggestive successes in a range of other areas. And um, I guess the question that we want to address is sort of what role does theory have and how might you have uh, a theory formulated for this? And in particular, as was said, um, if you do VC theory and statistical learning theory, that doesn't depend much at all on the data, right? And a lot of algorithms in computer science are parameterized in terms of very coarse complexity measures like number of data points um, or overall space or overall time. And so what does it mean to develop a theory that depends so strongly on, on the data? And, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But I already gave you an example of what is not theory, at least not theory in what I want to talk about. So in, in science and engineering, a theory is sort of a framework. It may have math or not, where you make essentially falsifiable predictions that guide practice in a fairly strong way. You make a prediction, and then you try and falsify it. And, and the prediction provides some, some check that you can you know, prove right or wrong. And that is, is rather different than the way the word, word theory is used in other places. For example, a lot of statistical learning theory which does not do that. Um, Heavy-tailed random matrix theory is something we're going to use, or, or you know, non-heavy-tailed random matrix theory. Um, those, that's not theory in the sense that I want to use the word. It, it, that's a bunch of theorems, and it's, it's a body of, of work that's, that may or may not be useful. But it's, it's a bunch of theorems that typically say theorem, you know, if you set something up, then um, you either get this result, something concentrates in random matrix theory or whatever, or um, you get an upper bound on, on generalization or something else. But um, the setup is usually in terms of assumptions that can't be checked. And so the predictions are not really falsifiable. They may be useful in a range of ways, but that's you know, to design models, to do whatever, but they're not really falsifiable. So um, that's not theory. So, so what, I, what I want is a practical theory. So I want to use theory that's legitimate theory that uses those sort of mathematical techniques but also makes very practical predictions. We had something in uh, Nature Communications a couple months ago, um, the title of which says it all, predicting trends in the quality of state-of-the-art neural networks without access to any training data or any testing data. So that's an example of a practical theory. Um, there's a lot of situations when you're outside, you know, just a small handful of internet and social media companies where you might want to evaluate the quality of a model and you don't have obscene amounts of data. How do you do that? And as an extreme case, can you say whether a model is good or bad without seeing any data at all? And you might say, well, that's, that's impossible because statistical learning theory says such and such. And if you formulate the question that way, you may be right. But, but you know, ask yourself, how do people who do use practical theory in other areas like engineering, um, how do they use theory and how do they develop things? So what a civil engineer does when they build a bridge is not the following. Build a bridge, drive a tank over it, see when it breaks, and then iterate that process. You know, they have engineering principles that, that says you need stresses and strains and stuff. They don't prove a theorem starting with the hydrogen atom and they don't drive a tank over it. They, uh, they try and use those in engineering principles. 
And, and that's not, essentially that's not what is done in ML today. That's not what's done in machine learning today. What's done in machine learning is more analogous to building a bridge and driving a tank over and seeing when it breaks. There's, there's really not particularly strong design principles that say how the model should perform. It's a lot of sort of experimental stuff um, and then wrapped up in, in a bunch of theorems where there's a fairly large theory practice gap. So I wanna try and bridge that gap. That's sort of the prior and what I'm talking about today. All right, so some introductory thoughts, a subset of which I've sort of given, but more specific to what I'll be talking about. Um, some empirical results. If you're gonna develop a theory, we're gonna follow the scientific MO. We're not gonna start with general statistical learning principles. We're gonna go look at the world. So we'll get some empirical results to inform the theory. We'll use a lot of techniques, essentially from statistical mechanics and random matrix theory and heavy tailed random matrix theory to formulate a phenomenological theory. Um, we have unpublished, so not, I'm not gonna talk about today, a way to justify this in terms of variance of the student teacher model. So I'll sort of allude to that, but, but that's not um, something that's mature enough to talk about uh, today because it's not out. Um, and then we'll use the theory and I'll show you how you use the theory. An example of how you use it is, is what I gave about predicting trends in the quality of state-of-the-art models without access to any training or testing data. And then um, maybe some, some sort of more general comments. So that's sort of roughly the outline. I think the protocols, people are gonna put questions in the chat um, and we, we can chat later, but if, if there's something, so I don't actually see the chat. If, if there's something in the chat, if someone's monitoring it um, and there's something urgent, I'm happy if someone wants to interrupt and ask a question to clarify um, you know, during the talk, but, but so either's fine with me. All right, so given a state-of-the-art model, can we tell if it's over-parameterized? There's a lot of work these days in over-parameterized models. And I know what that means for least squares. There's, there's a dimension N, there's a dimension P, you have an N by P matrix or an M by N matrix. If one dimension is larger than the other, you say it's over-determined. But what does it mean when you have these complicated models and there's not a linear dependency? And can you just parameter count? We know, we know that's not true from sort of general statistical learning theory. Um, can, is, is there, you know, how, how do you actually answer the question in a meaningful way? And, and when does it matter? So there's, there's recent work that was known decades ago in the statistical mechanics of learning having to do with phase transitions and fluctuational properties. Now it's gotten recent attention under the name double descent. And so and that's, that's a phenomenological signature, but, but how can you tell if it's parameterized? So that, I, don't, you know, I don't even know what that means because I, I don't know what you do with it in and of itself, except like in least squares. So let, let's ask a, a question that's sort of a consequence of that. And the question is, can you predict the trend in state-of-the-art models without access to training or testing data? And so that's an example of a very concrete question you might ask that's not motivated by general theoretical principles, but that it turns out you need some fairly heavy theory to, uh, to try and answer. So this is an odd question for machine learning people and AI people. If they're forced to say, they'll say, you know, of course you can't. Um, or they might say, um, yes or no, because a theorem says something. Or yes or no, if you assume some Bayesian something or other. Or yes or no, if there's some distributional covariates or something. And they'll say maybe depending on, you know, because convolutions do something. And so um, that's not, as I say, how people build bridges or do brain surgery or go look for oil or trade stocks or anything. So why is this the way we do AI and ML? So that's always seemed a little bit strange to me. And so this is sort of the context we'll be talking about here. So what is theory? There's a scientific theory, which is sort of um, descriptive. You know, it's, it says, this is the way the world is. It's not, um, it's not what you might want to call normative. This is the way the world should be. So if you think of mathematical economics, right? Mathematical economics, there's theorems about general equilibrium theory. If people optimize utilities and are convex, then you get something. Um, that's, that's, you know, that, that may be true, that may be false. If you test it, it's, it turns out it's, it's not a, the hypotheses about people's not particularly good, but then you could try and force people to be that way and say, geez, if you're not that way, you're doing something wrong in terms of how you assign liabilities or something in, in some sort of you know, contract interaction or something. So is a theory describing the way the world is or the way the world in some sense you want it to be? Um, and and th that sort of gets to the heart of the difference between um, the theory if it's you know, said a slightly different way than I said before. And so this is this may this matters in a sense. So are you describing or prescribing? Are you are you saying the way the machine models should be, or are you saying the way they were they, the way they are? So you might say, geez, models are good if they control capacity, because we know that from VC theory or something. Um, on the other hand, that was known decades ago, and 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 something you know you, you didn't get state of the art results in computer vision and NLP, and in the last five or ten years you do. What's different? Why are the models getting what they get now? Um, it's, it's easier to shape parameters as in size parameters. And by this, I mean formally or informally what you'd use the term in statistics, right? The shape parameters and the size parameters for distributions. And roughly shape parameters um, have to do with the shape of a distribution and size parameters have to do with how big it is. 
it's easier to prove theorems about the size parameters. If I'm strictly, if everything is less than some size, then something happens. De dealing with the whole shape, you got to integrate over the shape. It just becomes more complicated. So it's harder to prove theorems, in particular data agnostic theorems, but, but data aware theorems um, in terms of shape. So therefore, there's a selection bias against that. Again, when, when you do theory, it turns out shape parameters are particularly useful for, for certain things that, that we'll get to here. But you know, just the form of the theory people want to ask provides a bias against certain types of analysis that in this case happen to be useful. Constraints on the type of theory. Um, worst case bounds deal with norms. Um, the shape of, for example, an eigenvalue distribution is more related to a volume. Think of a determinant. You know, it's more related to how spread out things are. And if you have a hard time proving theorems of certain forms, that may be the relevant statistic. But if, if it's biased against that, then there's going to be a theory practice gap. And determining causality. I wouldn't even mention this because it seems so obvious that you shouldn't try and back out causality for correlation. One of the use cases we had of using the theory is we did a post more, I mean, after we introduced our results about a year later, some people introduced a paper with a fantastic title um, and uh, about fantastic generalization metrics. So it had a fantastic title, but they were essentially trying to back out correlation, back out causality from correlation. And they just, you know, threw everything into a box and optimized something and tried to invent causality metrics. And we just went and looked at it with the stuff we were doing and, and boom, you know, if you partition the data, there's a Simpsons paradox. So it seems obvious to say you shouldn't try and back out uh, causality from correlation, but, um, you know, sometimes people do in, in, in sort of more complicated ways than is immediately obvious. And so um, theory that is close enough to what's going on, you know, um, even if we don't know what the causes are, we can determine when there's problems, such as when there's a Simpsons paradox. And you have to go back to the data and the domain to try and figure out why. So, you know, we can use this if you use the right form of theory. All right, so general comments. Let me look at some empirical results. And um, I think these results are not obvious to people. I mean, I've described this over the last couple of years. And um, sometimes people really want to get into the details here. And it surprises me because in certain areas, what you do before you do any theory is look at empirical results. And um, in other areas, you, you do theory without any empirical results. So I want to go over some empirical results. And um, I'm going to oversimplify. The, the, the whole situation is very complex. So you know, if you look at 1,000 models, and I'm going to present three slides in five minutes, you're necessarily oversimplifying. But I'll, I'll present the sort of high level view. And then if there's any questions, I can go into more details. Some of these slides, these particular slides, this next section are a few years old. And so we have much a, a broader range of results. We know when these things. Um, but so I'll present the 10,000 foot view initially. OK. Don't analyze one or two neural networks. If, if someone's analyzed one or two, tell them to go home and analyze your hundreds of thousands. So when we started this in 2017, there was dozens of publicly available networks. A year or two later, there was hundreds. Now there's thousands. So I mean, you know, any one or two net models or data sets you try and look, look at, you may overfit to. So that was sort of the design principle. Um, and another design principle is don't use bad models. If you want a, a theory that works for everything, yeah, good models, bad models. But no one wants a theory that works for bad models. They want theories that work for good models. And so if there's a difference between how the theory performs on good and bad models, you should highlight it. And in particular, look at state-of-the-art models. Now, I'm at a university. I'm at Berkeley. I'm in the statistics department and RISE and EECS. So conditioned on being at a university, I have access to a relatively healthy amount of computational resources. Now, conditioned on being in publishing in the same area as people at Google or Facebook or Amazon or wherever publish, um, I have 10,000 X less computational resources. So when we're looking at state-of-the-art models, we don't necessarily just want to train because the usual MO in training is just get huge amounts of compute and just let the machines run. So we're going to not do that. We're going to put a, our thought processes elsewhere, not in designing systems, but in trying to figure out what's going on with the data. But we want to look at state-of-the-art models. Um, and as an extreme case, um, for most of what I'll be talking about today, we know the answer in a little bit more refinement. I'm not going to train any models. I want to look at publicly available models. So there are hundreds and thousands of models out there that are good. They're good by some measure, namely that they're good enough that someone wrote a paper and pushed them out the door. They, they were good for production. They were good for something. They may or may not be good in other ways. And so we'll look at that. But, but I want to look at publicly available models because there's so many hyperparameters and knobs here that it can be hard to tell if a model's broken or things. So I just want to work on look at models that are publicly available. So then you can't blame me if the models are messed up. You know, these models are out there and, and we're analyzing them. And I think that's an important point because there's so many knobs here, it can be hard to keep track of what's going on if people train their own models. All right, so here is Lynette 5. Lynette 5 is a model that is state of the art if we were talking 20 years ago. So it's, it's um, you know, this is, this is typical of models pre 2013 or so. 
So what I want to show you in a bunch of these plots is um, look at the weight matrix. And the weight matrix is a matrix. It captures a lot of information. And what I want to show you basically is the eigenvalues of that matrix. And if it's a rectangular matrix, take A transpose A, so you're looking at a correlation matrix. Um, now, I understand that these are layers. You may feed into nonlinearities. There's other layers. If there's multiple layers, we've got to average the right way. There's noise issues. So this is what I said. I'm not going to, I mean, I could talk for three hours on this, but so let me not go into those details. Um, we're going to look at the, the, the layer weight matrices, and we're going to look at the eigenvalues of that, so the correlational structure. Oftentimes, you normalize the weights at initialization, and you do various ad hoc things to keep the weights normalized. So on average, the Frobenius or spectral norm, you typically have control over. So the question is, how do the eigenvalues look? And on the x-axis here is going to be the eigenvalues. Um, and the y-axis here is, this is just a histogram of eigenvalues. So um, look on the right first. You know, it has this sort of shape. It's not quite round, but it's, it sort of goes up and down. And, and um, there's some stuff that bleeds out a little bit on the right. Um, the right is actually a zoomed in of the left, which is the same shape, except there's a few guys that go out to about 20. And then in red, I did the best MP. My MP is marchenko Pasteur. Marchenko Pasteur is, is the rectangular version of, of the Wigner semicircle law, the Wigner quarter circle law. You know, so the semicircle law you get from random matrix theory. If you're dealing with um, rectangular matrices, you don't get a semicircle, you get a different functional form. And this is the shape for this particular aspect ratio and variance scale. So older models look basically like this, pretty well fit to random and some stuff sticking out there. So if you're a statistician, ask yourself what this means. We'll get to it in a few slides, but this is what you see. Okay, so now AlexNet, and this is typical of everything post-2013. Um, same plot, look on the right. Um, what you see is, so look on the, look, look, now I'm going back to Lynette. So you're extremely well fit to MP and you have a little bit of stuff bleeding out on the, on, the, on the far right, but just a little bit. Now look at this. The best MP fit we could find is, is, gives a huge gap of mass. You're missing mass um, in the range, you know, zero to two, I guess. And then you have a huge amount of mass out two to four and beyond. So this is this may look sort of like it's fit well by random, but it's extremely poorly fit by random. This is a terrible, if your hypothesis that is that you're in what's called an NTK limit, there's some you know, nice Gaussian type limit, you know, you're, this is, you're not even close. So this is very, very not like that. Um, so the newer state-of-the-art models post-2013 have heavy tail structure, much, much more mass far out. We're going to talk about heavy tails in terms of a particular parametric form, power laws. You could use other parametric forms. Um, so I don't want to get into a debate about that because it's a sinkhole and the exact parametric form doesn't matter. We could fit to other parametric forms and use the parameters that we fit in our semi-empirical theory. But for simplicity, we'll be talking about it in terms of, of power law forms. Um, in which case, um, you know, you might say, I want to find a line on a log log plot or look at the shape on a semi-log plot. So most of the plots I'll be showing here are going to be linear linear, um, which is not a good way to view that. Um, in some papers, we have log log and linear log, which are suggestive. But again, it's, it's, it's a whole complicated story to try and get into those details. I'm not going to get into those today, except to say um, you shouldn't just take some code and press the big green button. There's a lot of subtleties in terms of, I mean, Gaussian universality classes are so robust just because you know everything's good there. If you deal with things that are heavy tailed, variance is a lot of other issues. So there's a lot of subtleties in doing the fits, but we sort of know how to do the fits now. So this is AlexNet. Um, and think of everything post-2013 looks like this. Very poorly described by the Marchenko picture red line, and then a bunch of mass bleeding out to higher eigenvalues. Now, you might say, geez, that means you're sort of low rank. But, but you know, if you keep a small number of components just beyond the MP edge, you know, how well do you do? Um, the fact that there's eigenvalues empirically in this, quote, bulk inside this red regime doesn't mean they're random. It just means that through the lens of coarse global eigenvalues, they look random, right? I'm doing spectroscopy on this network. And so there's some things I can't tell the difference. So if you're familiar with how random matrix theory started, Wigner was modeling nuclei and, and nuclei are not random. They have a lot of interactions, but he said, I'm going to model all this junk as random and then look at a few low lying energy states. Those low lying energy states are the eigenvalues out here on the right. So you should think of that. So the stuff going out on the right, the stuff in that bulk that um, is not random, it's real, but you know, maybe too hard for you to model. So this is sort of in the back of our mind as we're developing these plots. Um, you look at hundreds of things, you know, this is one of the early exceptions that proves the rule. We sort of saw this, this is um, inception V3. Um, it was a little unusual because it has two separate, uh, I, don't, I don't see my pointer. So if you look at the plot on the left, two separate pieces in, in this particular layer to the, to the blue or to the purple um, histogram. 
I, I don't know how this was a this particular model was developed, but this sort of looks like someone pasted together two models and didn't optimize it enough to have it have it be a nice smooth line. So there's lots of funny stuff, but but this is an example. But but if, this is also not even close to Marchenko Pasture random. Um, very very common. So now if if you if you look at those and you say I want to take this plot and fit this plot to a heavy tail or a power law distribution, you ask what's the function, what's the parametric, the parameter. Um, yeah, here's a histogram. This this slide is, is way out of date, but it gives you an example. Um, now we have a factor of 100x more plots to flesh this out. You see most of them are between two and four, some go up to about five or six. And so um, there's a quality of how, there's a question of how good these fits are. Um, the power law fitting is good between two and three and a half or four. Above four, it's sort of equally bad, just the, the, the way the fitters work. Um, and it turns out we're going to want smaller exponents, meaning closer to two. But if you get below two, we don't want that because because then you get atypicality. Um, but but the point is this plot. This is about a three year old figure. We saw a huge number of things in CV and NLP, and now it's a few years later. And these this I can have a version of this figure with, as I said, hundred x more um, um, data sets, and 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 uh, you know would flesh this out. So the, so this is a very ubiquitous property. One of the things that you know you can ask yourself is how do these these things change with time, and in particular, you know, if you, for example, have GPT versus GPT two, um, or BERT, you know, in, in a more refined version of BERT, how do these things change? And um, a lot of examples, GPT versus GPT two provides an example of a model that improves over time. So I said you want you tend to want smaller exponents, and on the right, what you see is if you fit this, um, then the I guess it's the orange or the yellow is GPT, you know. Stuff's not always between two and four. It's, this is a theory about some very complicated, messy thing. But overall, the whole histogram shifts down a little bit to the left for GPT-2 and more recent versions just shifts down even more. So you see the right deltas over time. So this is sort of the background empirical results. So pre-2013, you had a, you're pretty well fit by random with a few things sticking out. Post-2013, you got these very heavy tails. All right, so what is going on here? Um, and does this even make sense, right? Some people were criticizing us saying, oh, you're looking at eigenvalues. These things are nonlinear. What can you do? I mean, and it, a lot of stuff that's not nonlinear boils down to linear analysis. You know, so I mean, not, I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying we're looking at this through a certain lens and what we see is, is, is um, something very ubiquitous. So we want to now is develop a theory and justify it in terms of um, some theoretical principles and then use that theory. So random matrix theory and random matrix based theory for neural networks and deep learning. So I've alluded to some of these things. So random matrix theory 101, if you've not seen this, this is the 101. If you have seen this, you'll see sort of the level of granularity at which I'm simplifying things. So Wigner semicircle law says that the bulk global statistics approach a universal uh, semicircle. Are you in the asymptotic or not asymptotic regime? Measure zero, not measure zero. I mean, all these are sort of ways to formalize this, but you get a semicircle. Um, there's interesting things going on at the edge, and we lost a lot of sleep worrying about what's going on at the edge, because if you know a Gaussian distribution, a Gaussian distribution goes to some limit, but it has a scale of variance. Um, Tracy Whittem is sort of like that scale of variance, but it's a different functional form, and it's a very universal form, and it's a different functional form because on one side of the semicircle, things are correlated, eigenvalues, and on the other side, they're sort of independent. You know, you, you, get, you get spikes that stick out from this bulk, and so you get a different functional form, and so the question that uh, we lost sleep over is, when we see these eigenvalues slip out, um, are these sort of finite size effects that are right near the bulk edge or are they well outside? So if I have a bulk here and I have an eigenvalue at, at 20, you might say, yeah, clearly that's way out there. But what if I have one at two and a half or two and a quarter? So, um, so we've dealt with those things and um, you know, there's, there's always room for improvements around the corners, but let's, let's leave that aside. But this is something we lost a lot of sleep over, but 101, you get a semicircle um, and you gotta worry about the bulk edge. 102. Weight matrices are not square and satisfy exactly the assumptions of this Wigner model. Um, if you do 102, you get marchenko pistor So you don't get a semicircle. So let's say I have an M by N matrix, M by N or N by M. Um, then you get a functional form that's not a semicircle, but looks like this thing, this functional form here. So what does that functional form look like? That functional form, it depends on the aspect ratio and the variance scale. So as you change the aspect ratio and the variance scale, you get plots that look like this. Um, some of these plots actually look like they go out sort of far. So they look maybe, oh, this looks heavy tail. It goes out far. Um, but these all go to deterministic limits. And at the edge, they all have the same Tracy Whittem uh, correction. So if you're rectangular, same ideas go through. You don't get a semicircle. You get this other shape, um, which is a little bit more like this, the shapes we saw, you may notice. And, um, but you still have a sharp edge and you have Tracy Whittem fluctuations at the edge. So 
Um, 102 is the same as 101. You just got to be a little bit more careful, and, and but, uh, but the same ideas go through. Um, when I'm saying they're heavy-tailed, I'm saying it's not this. This is still IID Gaussian or IID Gaussian universality classes. You're just rectangular. When I'm saying before things are heavy-tailed, you're not this. And so the, the best null model is 103. And this was mostly from physics and quantitative finance in the 90s. And in the last 20 years, it's been mathematized a bit more. So this table has some things that are mathematical theorems, some things that are derived at a physics level, sort of rigor, if you want to call it that, some things that are observed phenomenologically. So I'm not going to go into the details of, of which of those three is each. It's in the long, it's in the paper. But the first line is basic MP, which is what we've been talking about. And so it's Gaussian. I, I don't have my pointer, but the first line is, you know, it's Gaussian MP distribution. TW means the tracy Witten fluctuations. The next line is you could have Gaussian and then a few eigenvalues stick out. That's, it's, in statistics, called the spiked covariance model. There's a few spikes, and other, other than that, it's random. And then there's the heavy tail uh, universality classes. And this depends on the parametric form, the details of the process. It's less robust than the Gaussian universality class. But roughly there's three things you need to care about. One is if the power law exponent is um, greater than four, one if it's in the two to four regime and one if it's less than two. So if it's greater than four, sometimes you get things that look Gaussian-like, although some of the details are different and it depends on um, asymptotic things we don't wanna get into. If you're less than two, you're so heavy tailed that you see that in the elements of the matrix. Between two and four, there's the interesting regime we're gonna to want to see where you're heavy tailed. You may, you know, it's not, you're not at the point where four moment results kick in. You're not at the point below two where you start to fail to get means and variances. And so you get heavy tailed properties, but um, you get something different in the asymptotic versus non-asymptotic state, this large finite size effects. So th this is the regime we're sort of interested in. Um, and so a lot of interesting open questions here, I think motivated by what we did and, and sort of more generally. So based on this, let, let's at least get an initial phenomenological theory that says, you know, I'm gonna try and classify what's going on in these models um, by, by the empirical spectral distribution. And I, I want to have basically three phases, but let me call it five plus one. So top left is, if I look at the final model through the lens of, of random matrix theory, top left, it looks like MP. It looks you know, like Wigner or MP, that's the top left. Top right is it looks like MP, but there's some bumps out there. So it's bulk plus spike. Bottom middle says, well, it's heavy tailed. So again, this is a linear linear plot. That's not a particularly good way to view it, but you know, if you fit functional forms, if you look at log, log and semi-log instead of this linear linear plot, so it's heavy tailed. Then you have two crossover regimes, B and D, you know, where you start to bleed mass out to be spike-like where you start to bleed a lot of mass out to become heavy tailed. And then there's sort of a degenerate case in the bottom right. So right now this was phenomenological in terms of heavy tailed, just random matrix theory. So we have a theory that's a little bit more like a semi-empirical theory where you fit certain parameters. And based on that, you're consistent with underlying um, um, random matrix theory or whatever, but now you're able to make phenomenological predictions. As I said, we have results that aren't out yet in terms of justifying this, in terms of a generalization of a student teacher model to a matrix a version of a teacher where you put in heavy uh, tailed um, structure on, on the teacher or, or, or non heavy tailed structure, depending on what you want, but we're most interested in the heavy tail regime. So I'm not gonna go into that today, but um, if, if you like that sort of uh, analysis better, you know, we can justify this in terms of that. Um, all right, so what does this have to do with what we've been talking about? So um, Lynette five and everything before 2013 looks like bulk plus spike. You have a low rank matrix plus a few spikes. The low rank part is, it, it, it may or may not be random, but it's consistent with random. The spikes is, you, you think that's where the signal is. Um, as, an, as an asterisk, we actually, in, in the nerves meeting coming up, we have not for weight matrices, but for Hessians, a detailed analysis of, he, of random matrix analysis of, of uh, Hessians, where you can get spikes, not due to signal, which is the usual way you get spikes, but just due to the functional form of the models. So we, you know, we can apply these ideas using deterministic equivalence, to, um, to non-linearly transformed models with a Hessians. And, and depending on the specifics of the, of the model and, and the various moments, you can get spikes in the absence of any signal. So we haven't applied that to here, but these spikes, this is phenomenology, these spikes may or may not be due to signal. In this case, we have evidence that they are, but just as an FYI, I mean, you could have spikes just due to the functional form of the model, which is relevant because you change parameters, you change the functional form of the model. So this is something else that's maybe of interest. Um, but, but here we have, bulk plus spikes. Um, and so older, smaller, like Lynette 5, the two points here. One is if you remove the bulk, 
um, and to keep just the spikes, your, your, your prediction quality on MNIST, which is what Lynette 5 gets 99.8 on, whatever goes down to 94 or whatever. So the spikes contain most of the signal. So 94 is better than 10 and it's better than 91. It's not 99.8. So you have most of the information in the spikes if you have to keep just 10 out of the 500 eigenvectors. But the bulk contains a lot of information. It's just, it's, it's consistent with the hypothesis of random when you're looking at it through the lens of global eigenvectors. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, when people usually think about regularization, what they say is I'm solving least squares. So I'm solving an objective, convex or least squares, whatever. And um, it's a little ill posed, there's noise. And so I don't just want to minimize F, the objective. I want to minimize F plus lambda G, where G is an L1 or an L2 or whatever regularizes. So ticking off regularization is sort of a canonical example. And your F plus lambda G, and I guess I'm calling lambda alpha here, your F plus lambda G, um, the lambda sets a scale. And below, roughly below lambda, your noise, or you're consistent with the hypothesis of noise, above lambda, your signal. So you introduce a scale, and almost all of these ML models introduce a scale. And one of the things that comes out here is if you're really power law and really heavy tailed, you don't have a scale. You know, you, you have many scales of which there's correlations. And that's one of the key lessons in terms of this entire analysis. You have something where you where well, well trained models post 2013, um, you, you train them, the details of SGD and correlations and this and that and batch size. You train them such that you get correlations from that you squeeze out correlations from the data over many size scales. And so the reason you're, you're eating out the bulk is that you don't do this. We'll get to that, but you don't do this. So, so the, the way to think about traditional regularization is you introduce a scale and you ignore stuff below that. Um, so that's the way to think about this. Um, what, what you see instead for everything post-2013 is that the weight matrix is, let's call it strongly correlated. It's, it's very non-random, right? Because you train this very strongly to the data, but when we're modeling the strongly correlated systems or, or the strongly correlated features, because you've trained these, I didn't, someone else did, but and pushed them out of state of the art. Someone said GPT-2 is great. So we looked at it. We saw that you get strong correlations over many size scales. And we're modeling that with heavy tailed random matrix theory. So we went back, Bouchard and Potters, you know, um, we went back and um, used ideas from that and where they wanted to get quantitative predictions for, for a strongly correlated, in that case, financial time series. Um, so we're modeling the signal, but not the noise by, by heavy tailed random matrices. That's a big change in terms of how people usually would use this. Um, and if that's the case, then the elements, element wise, the trained matrices, the elements may or may not have heavy tails. Typically they don't, but the correlations do. So the elements don't because people do, you know, clip elements, large elements or whatever, which introduces a form of regularization. But um, in, in doing that, the Frobenius and spectral norms have a scale, but you engineer correlations over many size scales. And, and so you see that in the ESDs, that's sort of what's going on. So quote, all mo modern models exhibit this. Um, and and the, you know, I can spend an hour going into the details of what I mean by quote. Essentially think to first approximation, everything um, has, has these sort of properties. Good models, if you push out bad models, I mean, who knows, they certainly don't. Okay, so mechanisms. I don't know what mechanisms are. If you go back, there, there's a lot of different mechanisms. They go by different names. I don't wanna get into that today. If you want, we can talk offline about this, but there's a lot of different mechanisms that might give rise to heavy tails. And this gets into a lot of religious debates. So uh, we have ideas on that, but but to use the theory, we don't need a mechanism. I mean, it's it's phenomenological. We, we have mechanisms to reproduce certain properties. Those, those may or may not be the mechanisms going on in, state-of-the-art trained model. So that's another discussion, but to, to do what we're doing just for this time, we don't need a positive mechanism. Um, and the other thing is that um, what's not going on here is least squares or convex objective plus lambda G, call LA pack, call CVX, call whatever. You know, we don't have an explicit regularization. We have what's now called implicit regularization. So if you wanna know what implicit regularization is, you should go and read this paper I have on the bottom of the page where we were talking about approximate computation. This is about 10 years ago, approximate computation and implicit regularization. So this was something that no one was thinking about back then. Now there's a lot of talk in terms of implicit regularization in ML and implicit regularization basically is a very small subset of what we were talking about 10 years ago. Implicit regularization these days in ML means I'm doing sloppy stochastic gradient descent and there's some noise and I can't control everything and I see that there's some regularization. And that's, that's a very narrow view on what really is implicit regularization. Implicit regularization basically means I'm solving an objective, I'm solving it approximately, and um, theorem, I, I don't exactly approximate the objective, but I get within epsilon. So theorem, I'm faster, but I get within one plus epsilon of the objective. Theorem prime, um, I'm faster, and I exactly solve objective plus lambda regularization. 
and, and there's various ways where you can exactly um, say, in addition to being an approximation algorithm, I exactly solve a regularized problem. And so the stuff people are talking about today is, is sort of a very narrow subset of it. And I think if you take a step back and just look at it more generally, that's, that's what's going on here and, you, and you'd see that. So you could have implicit regularization where the control knobs are batch size and step size and all the things that ML people fiddle with and not the Lambda, right? Because that's not, not a control parameter typically. And what we call this is heavy tailed self regularization because the training of the model itself you can fiddle with batch size and step size and whatever you want to do, but conditioned on getting state-of-the-art results, um, you can do this in various different ways here, depending on you know your your higher the memory hierarchy in your machine and, and you know whatever you want. But but if you do this and you do this to death and you get good results, then conditioned on getting good results, the model in and of itself um, has empirical signatures of of regularization. So so the training process itself forces regularization that's heavy tailed over many size scales. And it's hard on MNIST or some very small model to have many size scales. So you really need the scale that the recent CV and NLP models give you. All right. Um, the intuition here we actually used from um, soft condensed matter physics. And so we, we use the heavy tailed ideas. We tried to graph them onto a people. Of, I did a lot of work on random matrix, randomized linear algebra, random matrix theory with a lot of theorems. And so we tried to identify failure points in, in spectral graph theory and random matrix theory and randomized linear algebra using ideas from on the soft condensed matter theory. And, and the idea is that um, the intuition is that if you have sort of a random you know, a protein, for example, a random heteropolymer, um, a protein is not a random heteropolymer. If you take a random heteropolymer, go to the biology lab and construct it, you heat it up, cool it down, heat it up, cool it down, you can do that for the age of the universe. And when you cool it down, you always get some folded state, but you always get a different folded state. And you can do this a gazillion times, you always get a different folded state. Um, if you have a natural protein, heat it up, cool it down, heat it up, cool it down, every time you get the same 3D structure. And why is that? And it's, it's because you have some sort of rugged convexity. You know? And that's not because of the combinatorial structure of the random heteropolymer, it's because of the details of, of you know, which, which amino acids you have. and and. You know, proteins need to fold in order to live in cells so that you can run away from the proverbial tiger. And so, um, and so this, this, there's a selection effect and, and you get you know, four natural proteins, they, they fold well. So by analogy, you know, a, a, an arbitrary neural network pre-trained or you know, trained to garbage data, I mean, who knows what, you, know, you get different weights every time, but conditioned on the selection effect of training to good models, stress testing it, there is some sort of um, rugged, let's call it a rugged convexity. Meaning if I squint at the figure on the right, it looks sort of convex. It goes down, looks like a quadratic well. The figure on the left is nothing, right? It's just a bump. And if you look at Hessian and very fine scale information, gradients and Hessians, you can't tell the difference between the left and the right. But if you, if you zoom out and squint at it, you can. And so this is what spin glass theory and statistical mechanics does. Um, those are not tools that ML people are familiar with. So based on the results I'm talking about today, you know, we, we did some results on, you know, Ching Yang has results on, on sort of taxonomizing lost landscapes that'll appear in this year's NERPS, not using um, overlap integrals from random matrix series statistical mechanics, just using machine learning tools. And so if, if understanding lost surfaces of interest, um, his taxonomizing um, lost landscapes paper that's gonna appear in NERPS this year sort of uses that. So this is in the back of our mind, but we, we wanna hide this from the user. We don't want the user to know about proteins and we don't want the user to know about spin glass. We want the user to know about just a few operational knobs. Um, and and um, it's one thing to, to prove a theorem. It's another thing to make it work. Um, if you don't believe me, go online, um, pip install Weight Watcher see if it works on your data, see if it doesn't work on your data and try and break it. So um, if, if you have a falsifiable theory, it should be open for other people to reproduce, try and reproduce what we did. So this is all joint work with Charles Martin um, today. Charles Martin, someone I got to know five or six years ago, and um, he had a similar background in terms of um, statistical mechanics. And he's done a lot of work in recent years in machine learning like I have, except from a more industrial perspective. And he was interested in using these ideas to come up with metrics for his very practical problems. And so we wrapped this in, in, a, in a software tool, uh, Weight Watcher. So go pip install Weight Watcher. And um, um, we have a Slack channel. So join us on Slack or send us questions or whatever. Um, and, it's in, and we have a well-defined metric of success, right? Sometimes in machine learning, you don't know if you're gonna succeed. If when, once you get our cease and desist order from Weight Watcher, we'll know we will have succeeded. But in the meantime, um, 
where we're analyzing weight matrices. You train the model, we analyze the weight matrices. So we're watching weight matrices. You can use this for training. We've used this for training and some other things like that, but I'm not gonna go through that today, but pip install weight watcher, if you like. All right, so we wanna use the theory. <clears throat> Let me see, all right, about 10 minutes. All right, so you can use a theory in different ways. You can use diagnostics for model validation and developing hypotheses. You can make predictions about model quality, generalization, whatever. Um, you can do post-training modifications. I have a big model like BERT and I have a little bit of extra data and I tweak it. That's a common thing people do. A very practical question is, um, I have a million dollars. Should I spend that buying more data? Should I spend that buying more person time, analyst time? Should I spend that buying more machines? Right. Um, I have a model. Will buying 10x more data help improve it? Or should I do 10x more compute? Or should I, you know, spend the time hiring people to think about what's going on with the weight matrices or whatever we did? Will training longer help? Will fiddling with this knob help in, in a quantitative way? Um, um, you know, I may want to quantize or distill the model. Um, I may not have access to the original training data or testing data. Can I evaluate whether the distillation process worked beyond looking at training testing curves? Can I come up with metrics that allow me to evaluate the model without training and testing data so I can do something more refined than build a bridge, drive the tank over it, see that the tank breaks and you know that ate up huge amounts of compute and time, uh, compute time and person time. So um, these are various questions, the way you'd actually wanna use a theory. I mean, using not proving theorems, but using the theory. Um, and so one thing you might say is I want to fiddle with batch size. So batch size is something people fiddle with a lot. And in fact, the figures I showed you before were from that. So um, batch size um, during the training process um, is you go to smaller batch sizes, it's believable that you might squeeze out finer scale correlations. This has computational side effects. So leave that aside for a question for a second. If you go to smaller batch sizes, um, it may be believable that you squeeze out more correlations. And so the short answer is yes. So look at the ESDs as you change batch size from you know, 500, 250, 150, 25, on down to four or so. Um, you squeeze out finer and finer correlations. So you can ask, is this a fair comparison? Or did we train long enough? To, are we comparing apples and oranges? So let's leave that aside and I, we can talk about the details of that. But decreasing batch sizes induces stronger correlations in W, leading to more implicitly regularized models. If you don't want to decrease batch size because your computational infrastructure, you know, says I want to make the largest batch size possible, you could fiddle with one of the other knobs. And look, you see a similar plot with learning rate and some other things like that. Sometimes they saturate, and so you can't exhibit all five phases. But you know, um, we want to predict model quality. So um, if a model has ten layers, um, you might say I want to look at the norm of every layer and and use the average norm, spectral norm, Frobenius norm. I mean, there's ten different norms you can use. Um, you could do what we did and say, fit these exponents and look at the average alpha. Um, it turns out that um, the norm is basically a, uh, let me see the interest of time. The norm is basically a, it's a size metric. You know, there's different ways to quantify size, but a norm's a size. And so Frobenius norm tends not to be too good. Spectral norm tends to be better. That's an oversimplification, but they're both size metrics and um, they do okay on, on predicting various things. Um, but of course, you'd expect that norms would do reasonably well on predicting things because they were used in the training process. So that's not saying norms are particularly good at predicting generalization or model quality. It's just saying during the training process, you use norms to develop good models. And so therefore they should correlate with good models. But, but there's a lot of papers that say this means that they uh, are predictive of model quality. No one in the world uses alpha to train models, right? Um, so a question, you know, if, if alpha is as predictive, I mean, that's a strong statement, right? So um, there's going to be two things we want to talk about here. One is combine the two. So basically, you can take an average alpha and weight by the size of the norm. It should be the log of the norm, that, that second to last um, equation there, because um, you should really be doing this in log scale. Um, but OK, so it's, it's the norm. It's the log of the norm. And so that's a weighted alpha where you weight by the size of the norm. Bigger layers matter more in, in the weight. Um, alternatively, you can say that's a weighted norm um, where the weights are given by alpha. So combine the two into a weighted average. That actually does pretty well. And, and we had a, something a couple of years ago, um, um, which papers is yeah. So we had something a couple of years ago that showed that did pretty well. Um, and I'll present those results. And then I then want to tease those two effects apart. And um, it turns out that you can tease those two effects apart. So um, just in the interest of time and also because it will go into a lot of details, um, 
let me not go through the specifics of this, but say we did a very comprehensive analysis. We looked at you know dozens, you know, 50 different metrics. Most are terrible. Some needed data. Some um, norms did reasonably well. Alpha did a little bit better. Um, combining them did a little bit better. And so this was this, the paper in Nature Communications that we were interested in predicting trends in the state quality of state of the art models. And the idea is that I don't, you know, I don't know how these, you know, I don't have access to your training or testing data, but I can look at the structure of the model. If the, if the structure of the model has a certain norm structure, it's, it suggests something. If the structure of the model has a certain correlational structure, averaged over layers, maybe weighted by the log norm, so bigger layers, you should, you should weight the, the alpha more. Um, that's much more strongly predictive. And so the, and so the best metrics, um, so basically we have a metric that allows you to look at a model um, independent of how, I don't know how it was trained. You, you trained it, you gave it to me and, and I'm looking at the model. So I'm not driving the tank over the bridge. I'm, I'm trying to come up with some sort of design principles having to do with the training process where it's sort of semi-empirical. I think it has to do with extracting good correlations. Now we always want, um, you, you can use this to introduce a couple ideas. One is um, let's look at alpha versus depth this correlation metric versus depth. And in all these plots, uh, x-axis is, uh, is depth, y-axis is alpha, larger is worse. You want to be in the two to four band. And um, what you see very generally actually is um, the alphas are better on earlier layers and worse on later layers. The, the hypothesis is that we want some sort of correlation flow. And if you have a similar alpha across many layers, that, that, that'll be good for generalization performance. Um, we see empirical evidence for that. You look at VGG, um, you say, oh, VGG attack residual things on ResNet, see it's better. You see that VGG, it gets much worse very quickly. ResNet, if you get very, very deep, you tend to have a band there of, of red alphas in two to four before it gets worse. And then remember five to 10, there's, not, there's no difference. It's equally bad in terms of the power of the, of the fitter. Um, then some people would say, well, um, you know, if, if that's good, just tack on a bunch more edges, go to dense net, tack on lots more edges, the, the neural network will figure out everything. And the bottom left shows that's clearly false. I mean, you know, if you tack on too many edges, the neural net, you know, the model can't figure it out. You know, you've just tacked in too much garbage. And so the, it, it chokes. And that makes sense, right? That's you know, like, a, like an expander. Um, there's, there's too many possible ways. There's not enough, you know, for the information to flow. You haven't given it any sort of implicit capacity control. And so the model chokes. And so it's in fact worse by these metrics. So you can you could imagine now training later layers you can imagine doing neural architecture search. I mean, if we did this six, seven, eight years ago, you know, you could have used this in the development of ResNet or, or DenseNet. Um, and, and so you could imagine doing the analog of that now. Um, you could analyze pre-trained models. So the top um, is, is looking at a certain class of, of models in terms of our earlier versus later models. The bottom, you're looking at, at fine grained in terms of different layers and, and um, you, you can see some structure in them. And, and so when you go look at the model, the structure makes sense. Um, in particular, bottom right, you see something funny going on there. Go look at that and, and figure out what's going on there. Um, so we have some understanding of this. Um, one thing, you know, one of these auto so exceptions approved rule. So we had this hypothesis that you want similar alphas as you go down layers for, for sort of the, this correlation flow. Um, it's also easy to, to break models. I mean, if, if one way you could use this is, is I am, um, I receive models from you. I want to validate that you haven't given me a bad model on purpose. Maybe you're an adversary by accident. Maybe you just messed it up. And so there's a bunch of situations where um, hardware people, architecture people want to distill models. You know, think of the toy example of putting a model on a cell phone um, or, or, you know, smaller memory model. You want to quantize the model. Um, the usual MO is quantize it, distill, whatever, train a little bit more to, to you know, fix the things you messed up and return the model if it has good training and testing error. So question, um, good, you, you did that and you did well on training and testing error. Did you mess up the model in some other ways? The popular statistical learning theory metrics are not validated counterfactually. They're just sort of assumed and then you, there's a selection bias on publication, right? If, if, you, if you are product, pushing things into production, you get a good model, you push into production, are they not? So there is a bit of a feedback loop, but it's not really validated counterfactually. Um, and these SLT metrics drive the development of the model. So now let's say that I'm distilling. I can use these metrics I've been talking about today um, to ask, you know, is the distilled model better or worse? And this is a particular um, um, set of models, Intel's publicly available distillation package. And you'd expect that if you distilled the model and it, it's, it's a little bit better, um, the, the correlation structure as measured by the alphas would be better. And the bottom left shows sort of long story short, that's not the case. 
um, they broke the model and it was good enough for whatever they wanted by you know the engineering metrics and it was given to some downstream team and used for whatever but you know you got to wonder is this is this why sort of adversarial perturbations and models are not robust and, and and in this case i think that's the case right so the model was good enough but but it was damaged in ways that were not visible from just the training testing error people looked at Bottom right, you know, is a nice example because you can look at the GPT series. The original model that was released, they said it's so remarkable, we can't really release the, uh, the model. So they trained it to bad data. Then six months later, they said, well, we're gonna release a new version of the model that was trained to good data. And then six months later, they released a new version of the model that trained at 5X more data. And so you should expect that the model should behave in a very particular way as you go from model trained to good, but not great data, sort of bad data to model trained with good data to bigger model trained with more data. And then the bottom right, you look at the weeds of that. I mean, you, you, you'll see that. And that's largely hidden from norms and all these other metrics people people in, in uh, machine learning tend to want to look at, but, but it, it comes out very clearly. Sometimes it comes out looking at the alpha hat, the weighted version of the alpha. Um, in some cases it comes out by looking at the alpha and the um, norms um, separately. So this is the idea of correlation flow. You want alpha similar as you go down the layer. So the correlation um, sort of flows down. We're, we're working on quantifying that idea. But this was a hypothesis raised by the data. Scale collapse. In, in, in some cases you see, this is many layered thing. In some cases, um, the scale of the ESD of one or more layers changes dramatically. And that introduces sort of like a failure point. Um, and so what's going on with that? How can you fix that? Looking at that correlation traps. Oftentimes you get spuriously large eigenvalues which um, oftentimes are correlated with, with large entries. And those are sort of like traps. Those can be good or bad things. They, they, can give, they can give something at a larger size scale, like a nucleation site for other um, features to learn around, but it can also be a bad thing. And so we can look at all of these with Weight Watcher. In the last minute, let me just give you, we did this, this was good. And, um, and then um, some people had a contest in, at NURPS last year and says, we want to predict model uh, predict generalization. They wanted to back out causality from the, uh, from, the, from the correlations, essentially. There's a paper with fantastic in the title, which is a fantastic title. I, I think if you look at the paper and what they did and the way they structured the contest, there was a lot of issues with that, which, which our sort of paper sort of points out. But um, from our perspective, that's good. It's more publicly available models and, and you know we can look at it. Um, and so normally the contest is about the causes of good generalization, but like most ML contests, there's lots of subtleties. You know, ensembleization is always the best way to win. If you're not very, 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 very careful, you get information leakage because you can query the contest every day and do different featureizations and learn about the, um, the, the, the data you're not supposed to know about. Um, there's a big difference between zero error and approximately zero error that everyone seems to sort of ignore. But the contest people said all these models are trained to zero error. You look at it, well, it's in fact 0.1% error, but that 0.1% on 100,000 data points is a lot of data points. And so you can learn a lot from that. So we didn't just think the model is worth competing in. So I think we made a submission, but we didn't um, do a lot there. But we use this data to perform an analysis and essentially backed out a Simpsons paradox. So. There was models and tasks. Um, these, are, these are segmented, two different tasks. Long story short, a bunch of different architectures, think widths or depths, a bunch of different hyperparameter solver knobs. So these are the two things we want to deal with. All right. Um, what's the best one picture? Let me show you just in the interest of time. I don't know what the best one picture is. Um, maybe maybe the, uh, the right here. So Simpson's paradox is the following. I, I, want, I look at a large group of people and um, something goes up. You know, test score goes up with age, whatever. And then I segment the people into a bunch of different groups, grade, race, gender, you know, department, whatever. And I, I look at the same correlation. Does test score go up or down with that? Um, and it behaves the opposite. Or, or you lose the effect. It becomes neutral. I mean, there's, there's softer versions of this. Um, so increasing some variable is good if you look at the whole population and it's bad if you look at subpopulations. If you don't know about Simpson's paradox, this is a great thing to know about. It's something statisticians about go home and learn about it because it's, you know, it's hidden by most ML metrics. When ML people train models, they lump everything together and do empirical risk minimization. So it's very easy to lose this. And if you want to back out any insight in terms of correlation or anything, if, if you're not looking at this, um, it's, it's a blind spot. Long story short, look on the right. We segment the models in one way, curves always go up, 
put them all together, curves go down. And this thing on the right isn't a pathology. This is, a, this is just a canonical example of a Simpson's paradox. And what you see, this is here. The contest essentially had good models and bad models. If you lump them all together, then what you see is norm-based metrics are the best. But if you segment them out, the norm-based metrics don't do so well. They actually predict the opposite of what happens. If you lump all the models together, alpha seems to be doing something funny. But if you look at every segment, alpha is doing the right thing. So one, we can identify that there's problems in the data set. Two, we can identify there's problems in the structure of the contest. Three, we can make claims about you know, how the model should perform. Four, when we say better models correspond to better alpha, that's right. With norms, better models anti-correlate, which, which is sort of exactly the opposite of what the theory would predict, which is, which is a problem. All right, so we can we have this for both subgroups. One is much more prominent than the other. Um, lots of future directions. Um, I, I talked a little bit about expressing um, this in terms of machine learning theories. So lots of theorems, and just in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through this. We spend a lot of time, but we want we want this to be usable not just for people that have a degree in statistical mechanics, but for um, ML people. So we have a bunch of results. I'm trying to formulate this. So this is something from last year where we used um, random matrix theory to quantify phases of transition. We have something on characterizing the implicit regularization. Each of these slides is lots of theorems in the papers, characterizing the implicit regularization in, in sort of core linear algebra and regularized convex optimization. Um, here we have something on, on looking at typical case complexity. Here we have something on a mechanistic way using a Keston style mechanism to find um, sort of heavy tailed structure with multiplicative weights. This does it on the elements, not on the uh, on the eigenvalues, and we haven't been able to figure out how to combine it with the Kesson and the Fourier domain. Um, we can measure this is an this is you know you, you can measure um, use randomized linear algebra to, to, to measure um, eigenvalues at scale uh, of, of of the Hessian and other operators. So a lot of work, sort of taking these ideas and making them more amenable to um, I think a typical machine learning sort of audience. All right, with that, let me wrap up. So practical theory, I think is not an oxymoron. If you're, if you're using theory to do something practical, it, it should make falsifiable predictions and, and it should solve problems like um, diagnosing problems in contests. It should, you know, stating, you know, making statements about the quality of the model without, you know, unrealistic assumptions on the data. And it's, it, I think, one, it's useful for practical settings, but two, it stress tests the theory. I mean, there's a lot of work here in heavy-tailed random matrix theory and so on that people wouldn't ask if we hadn't seen these. And so I think it can be used to address very practical questions, but it, we've done a lot of work on sort of foundations of data. Berkeley has a tripods institute, if you know what that is. And I think questions at just the heart of the foundations of data um, are questions that are raised by sort of a very practical theory here. So with that, let me wrap up and I'm um, happy to stay around a bit if there's questions and discuss things and so on. And thank you so much, Michael. I think we already got a couple of questions on the chat, so I will just start right away. I think the first uh, question was already around uh, uh, slide 20 by Wu Yang Chen on the question whether the plots A to F are sorted by the training iterations. The, the, these plots can be generated a number of different ways. What we did here is very batch size. So there's no training iterations. And then we ran it long enough and saturated things. And, and so these are these are run sort of infinitely far, let's say. Um, there's details about how to do stop and stopping rules. So I, but, but think of it as these, these plots are run far enough that things don't change. And will they change if I run a factor of 10,000 longer? You know, I don't know, I didn't, but, but you know, they, don't, they aren't changing. Um, so the meaning that the control parameter is batch size, which is a control parameter people use. Um, and this is an end state of learning. Now, a different control parameter you could have used was batch size. So it was uh, it's step size and run step size, run long enough for things to saturate. You see very similar plots. A different thing you can do is to say, um, run and view this as a time series, you know, because if you start off with glow rod or typical initializations, you start off with a random matrix. You start off in the top left. Question, how do you evolve? So clearly with Lynette 5, you don't run through all these phases because you only go to the bulk plus spikes, you run, but you do run through the top line. Um, for a lot of the post-2013 models, you do run through all five phases during training, but it's a little bit more complicated than that because if a model has 10 layers, the, the different layers will converge at different rates. Sometimes a layer gets better. Um, and then as other layers get better, this layer gets worse and then it compensates. Um, 
And in some cases, you don't go through all five phases. You may skip a phase. It's sort of like in thermodynamics, you know, you, you could go from here to here. You could go around, you know, a transition point. So, um, so you can see this as as you on a single training run, but you can also not, and you can see a more complicated set of things. So that this is what these plots are revealing. Mm -hmm. Cool. <clears throat> okay, just another question on slide twenty eight. I think that was from Sankar Gilda whether the plots look similar for other layers uh, besides FC1? Um, yeah, is a short answer. Um, there's nothing special about, um, about FC1. It, it, in some of the cases, we looked at the early layers for the reason, so this is, this is a, a toy little thing. Um, you know, this is, one of the, this is one of the exceptions where we, we actually did change this. But in a lot of layers, you see the signal stronger in the earlier layers, and it's basically for, for this reason that um, typically as you go to later layers, things get a little bit messier. And, um, but you'd see that on FC2 and other later layers also. I mean, and, presume, and if you optimize these, you'd see the same thing top right. You see the same thing at lots of the later layers. Uh, it was just in the, in the early things, um, it was easier to see it at early layers, but you see the same thing at later layers, just sort of a, a messier version of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we're on the slide. Thank you. Uh, a question by uh, David Kreil, uh, whether you can use the Weight Watcher or uh, a Weight Watcher based metric for early stopping in the training process. Yes. Um, I think you can use these a couple different ways during training. Um, one way is early stopping. And I guess, please do it. I mean, that, that's not something, we, we have a priority list of things we're looking at. And I think most people in ML, want to train models. There's, there's a bias away from sort of validating and doing diagnostics and these finer scale things. And so we just haven't done that. Um, it's an obvious thing. Um, and if no one does it, we'll do it in a year, but um, you could. Now, just be a little careful because um, alpha by itself is not what you want. I mean, alpha is, what you want is a model that um, squeezes out information from the data and in particular squeezes out information or correlations on many size scales. So you, I could easily imagine a situation where you optimize alpha to death. You don't look at the data and, the, and, and you don't look at what you're doing. You know, you just press a button and, and look at training and testing curves and the model might fortuitously be optimizing alpha, but not really capturing correlations. Um, one way to do that would be um, make the weight matrix itself, itself heavy tailed. Right. So remember, I can have heavy tailed eigenvalues in, in one of two ways. I can have heavy tailed eigenvalues because the entries are heavy tailed. That's sort of a trivial reason. I can have heavy tailed eigenvalues because the entries are all size scale one, but I've captured correlations. We want the latter. So I could easily imagine you optimize alpha and you get the former. So, so you have to have a, a way to control for that. So, um, so I think the answer is, yeah, you can use it for training. When we've looked at it in terms of training, we've looked at something slightly different, which is, is not inconsistent with that, just a little bit different. This issue that different layers tend to converge at different rates. And so um, you might want to be optimizing the, the later layers or the earlier layers or some, I mean, you, when we look at the model that broke, it wasn't always later layers that, that, um, that needed help. I mean, it could have been inter intermediate layers. And so we're using alpha as a diagnostic for a range of things, but during the training process, we were looking at it a little bit more like that rather than just as, as a early stopping rule. So, but um, you can certainly do that, just modulo those caveats, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Um, there's a question from Gary Cottrell, whether there's a way to apply uh, your theory to ensemble models. One thing we've wondered, I mean, so ensemble is interesting because, you know, I, I think, th take a step back, think in terms of this rugged convexity that I described, right? If you have a bunch of models that are in that single rugged basin, and you take the average, just for entropic reasons, you might have a bunch of models sort of in a, in a shell away from the minimum. Then generic ensembling, you know, should work. You know, you take the average, you get, you know, a lower probability event towards the minimum. Now, if you are in an extremely atypical case, meaning your alphas are below two, it's more sort of like a, a spin glass, you know, so you're in an atyp. Now I run, run the um, training process a hundred times, I get a hundred models, but they're not in a single rugged basin. It's more like you're, you're getting different basins where there's a large energy barrier between them. Um, it could still be, <clears throat> so then taking sort of a quote average model will be bad because the model, you know, each of the models you get is sort of in the middle of a good basin and taking the average one might be bad. So it depends on how you do the ensembleization. 
if you do a majority voting, you might it might be the case that you have 100 models, each of which is correlated with something good, each of which is a little atypical, but not pathologically atypical, meaning it's, sort of, it's living around the finite size effect regime. And then you could use ensembleization there. And um, the short answer, I think you get two rather different results in those cases. And the way you'd use these ideas would be a little bit different in those two cases. Um, so yeah, I think I think you can, but but there's there's a little bit of a subtlety there. Okay. Um, a question from Marvin McCutcheon. Um, you focused on weight matrices. Uh, do you imagine that similar analysis on output gradients used, for example, for saliency maps uh, could be applied in a meaningful way? For example, frequency <laughs> analysis, et cetera. Yeah, we looked at weight matrices um, partly because we wanted to remove training, testing data, everything, right? We just mm -hmm. want to look at the final model. Um, most of the random matrix theory ideas we were talking about will, will hold for whatever, right? And so one example of that is what I mentioned when um, the results in the Hessians, looking at a, a broad class of generalized, generalized linear models, um, depending on the details of the nonlinearity and this and that, you can get spikes and you can get other things going on um, that, that aren't sort of what you'd intuitively expect from a random matrix theory. So that would apply for Hessians. Um, I think you could apply it to you know activations. I mean, a, a range of other things. Um, the Hessians are good because it's a very local metric, and a lot of people are using it. Activations. I mean, so it really depends, I guess, on what you have access to. If you have access to data and you can do these things, then similar ideas sort of may very well be applicable. <clears throat> I think saliency maps, which is a little different than the question, but I think saliency maps are sort of interesting because they're the sort of thing that um, are are they, they, they're not they're not validated typically counterfactually in, in the way I use the word. You get something suggestive and and if you get the heat at the right spot, um, you, you publish it and, and if not, you don't, right? So it's it, there's a feedback loop there, but but it's not really validated in the scientific sense typically. Um, one thing we have thought about is, you know, and, and not for these CV and NLP applications, but for, for sort of scientific machine learning, applying something like these weight analyses, um, to saliency type things and, and try and validate it counterfactually, um, just sort of as a, as a side point on saliency maps. But I, but I think you could apply it. There's not much peculiar to weights, except that we want to do that. A lot of the random matrix ideas would, would go through. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions from David Frey. Uh, the first one is uh, whether these results apply whatever the architecture of the model size is, and what are the limits of the theory? whatever the architecture is and what are the limits of the theory. Um, so what we tried to say is look at state-of-the-art models. And we wanted to look at models. We didn't want to do training. And, and that sort of limited us to computer vision and NLP. If you don't want to do training to, to remove that confounding factor, we've, we've trained a lot. So it's not like we don't want to do training, but for this discussion, um, and, and partly because of that, we know what a sinkhole of, of hyperparameters is a mess. To, so we wanted to deal with uh, uh, models. Um, and so if you're looking at state-of-the-art models that, other, that, are, that, are, that are publicly available, it's, it's CV and NLP. And, and it's not quite that simple. There's five different tasks in each of them. But, um, and we've tested the theory there. And to first approximation, it does as well as anything. And it does better than sort of almost everything else. Um, we've applied it in a couple other contexts, scientific machine learning, and every time we apply it to a new area, you know, parts of it break down and parts of it are um, sort of validated. Um, you know, we've looked a little bit at audio, but, um, but the, we don't have a broad enough set of models, you know, two or three rather than 50, and so to, to make firm claims. Um, the way I'd view this is this is a theory. This is, this is not a theorem. I mean, this theorem's at, towards the end of the talk that I just sort of glossed over. And so the only validation on this is to go out and measure stuff. It, not naively, right? Like I said, the alpha is not the thing. Capturing correlations is the thing. So if you were to use this, quote, use this theory for early stopping by naively just saying, I want to minimize alpha, you might be doing the wrong thing. So um, go out and test the theory on other things. And, and the theory will break and we'll have to refine it a little bit. I mean, maybe we need a better power law estimator. Maybe we need that. Um, so it's been tested fairly heavily on those on those models, but there's a lot of things that it's still open and we haven't tested it on. Um, and you know, we started this some number of years ago. Most of it was CV, which is a heavily saturated area. We were a little surprised it did well because in a lot of cases you cook into the architecture things that should make this analysis harder, right? I mean, if you're cooking convolutions into the architecture, 
then you would imagine I'm losing information in the, in the weight matrices, right? Because you cooked that into the architecture and it still did pretty well. Then we, there was a lot of NLP things that became available over time. And those are nice big, big fat layers. And these things perform sort of very well there. Um, if you, I, I could imagine that, you know, in some cases you do something very fine and, and you're not treating ML models as so fat, but you just put lots of features you're in, in a different regime and you cook so much information to the architecture that the weight matrices just say less. Um, we haven't seen that, but I could easily imagine that. So I think, I think there's, um, I hope that gives you sort of a sense of where the theory has been stress tested, but there's a lot of sort of regimes where it hasn't yet. Okay, thank you. And uh, the second question is, uh, you mentioned adversarial attacks. Uh, does that, uh, does the theory give you any insight on how to predict the presence of an adversarial example or how to make models more resilient other than possibly having better data? Yeah, I mean, have me back in a year or two and maybe when the world opens up and I'll be able to give you the answer to that. Um, we, we, have, we have some results, but I, I wouldn't say it's definitive enough to say for sure. The, the particular metrics here are rather coarse. They're trying to get large scale structure. Um, the... A lot of the adversarial stuff is very fine grained because the way people generate the attacks is looking at gradients. We've done stuff looking at Hessians and um, doing minimax sort of optimizations there. By itself, those are just totally different things, right? I mean, it's like this protein is rugged convexity, right? I mean, the adversarial attacks um, are making very fine statements and it doesn't know what the global rugged convexity looks like. This is designed to capture the global rugged convexity. Now, if you take this and you look at, for example, the uh, Ching Yang's paper on taxonomizing loss surfaces that I, that I mentioned that grew out of this, what he sees there is that you can look at certain metrics by themselves, they don't um, capture what you want, you know, three or four metrics. But if you look at them together, um, even having to do with mode connectivity, having to do with alpha, having to do with, with um, various other shapes sort of metrics, you can get a sense of the large scale surface, large scale architecture. And it looks like vision and natural language models are in some sense in different phases of, of, of the diagram. And so I think part of the answer to the question is will we'll be different in those two cases, right? Because if you use these global metrics, you got to couple them with the more local metrics and the way that interact would be different in those two. So I, the initial results seem to suggest that the answer to how you can you find adversarial attacks, we have a project on sort of backdoored, so not just the generic turn a stop sign into a yield sign, but sort of backdoored models where we're, which is you, you cook something into the training process that sort of is a, is a backdoor, you can come with the backdoor and attack it later. Um, so from that, it, it looks like the answer may be a little bit different between CV and NLP, but you got to couple those two together in, in, a, in a certain way. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I think we had just one last rather technical question also by Davide, uh, whether the slides will be available uh, for download. Uh, and I think we usually make uh, the slides available after the seminar to all the, all the subscribers. And of course, there's also the recording of the, of the talk. So the recording is available, I guess. The slides, mm -hmm. if you make them available, the, these slides are also available on my web page and, and other versions of them and iterations of them are available on the web page. You know the version from a few years ago. So um, you can go to my web page and pull them from there also if you want. Excellent. That that sounds good. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, with that, I think we are we are closing here. Thank you so much, Michael, for that very insightful uh, presentation and also for answering all the questions. Thank you and goodbye.